there's already been um, quite a bit of talk about uh, some just broadly speaking nuclear trends, things like that. So I'm going to focus a little more on something that I think will be useful to uh, all of you guys in the room, which is data collection about nuclear weapons and how we go about collecting our data and how you guys can go about collecting data about nuclear weapons as well. So mention this is me. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, the important thing, though, is that FAS, um, the Federation of American Scientists, uh, was founded in 1945, 1946 by many of the same researchers who worked on the first atomic weapons. And so it's kind of fun to come back uh, full circle. But today what, what we do is um, we make unclassified estimates about nuclear forces and trends, uh, and we, you know, we think about risks and, and all these things that we've talked about today. So our major research output um, is something like this. We have this in many, this in many iterations. This is sort of the broad strokes. Um, but we publish our estimates in, in things like the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the CEPR yearbook, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, and, uh, and other places as well. Because we're one of the primary organizations that does this kind of work, we're, we're often um, one of the go-to sources for journalists and, and folks like yourself. So perhaps you've used something like this in your data. If not, um, love to introduce you to it. It's, it's, we put a lot of work into it. Um, and this type of work is getting a lot more important uh, because you know we've we've talked about this a little bit, but as tensions between nuclear armed countries are on the rise, uh, nuclear opacity uh, is also on the rise, and countries are becoming a lot less transparent about their nuclear forces. And so that requires us and other organizations like us to use uh, what what we refer to as open sources um, to conduct our investigations. And so um, we basically. You know, the, the way that I think sometimes we think of ourselves and, and others in our community is that we, we're sort of doing investigative journalism, but, but on this extremely targeted scale using very specific methods. And so um, why do we need to rely on open sources? I mentioned this a little bit already, but it's generally because um, most nuclear armed states uh, do not release much information about their nuclear forces. That being said, there are very significant differences in how those countries do that, right? Some of them release basically nothing. Israel, right? <laughs> Israel, North Korea. Um, others occasionally showcase more general information. Um, others publish very detailed budgetary information, things like that. And the broad range of standards in nuclear secrecy is the result of a wide variety of factors, right? Things like um, history, governance, rule of law, uh, the role of civil society, public discourse, uh, having a robust media. And it takes a really long time for countries to develop a culture of nuclear transparency. Uh, and there are a lot of big differences in how countries do this. Generally speaking, but this isn't always the case, democratic states tend to release a lot more information about nuclear weapons. More authoritarian states tend to release less information. That is not always true. That's a very general statement, and we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, but something to note is that with the exception of the United States and France, no other nuclear armed country has ever made public the exact size of their nuclear arsenals. So uh, in one country I mentioned, Israel does not even publicly mention that it has nuclear weapons. And so all of these numbers up here, numbers that you'll see elsewhere, these are all estimates. They're estimates that we can make with the best data that we have available and using uh, what are open sources. So sometimes we get uh, these, these official declassifications that I mentioned, um, but they're extremely rare. So Really, the first time that the United States declassified their nuclear arsenal was in 2009, 2010, under the Obama administration. Um, they declassified the entire history of the arsenal, which was amazing. Uh, and you know, we, a, a nice bit of like organizational bragging here is that we were uh, 87 warheads off that total after an entire <laughs> history's worth of doing this kind of accounting, which is a lot of fun. Um, but it's, it's really rare that countries will do this kind of thing. And so we have to use different types of sources these have different advantages and disadvantages, and we'll go into that. Um, normally, it's exciting because most folks in the public, when I do presentations like this, they don't really care about how we get our information. They care about, they care about this, right? Um, but you guys are all journalists, and you're all nerds. So it's exciting. And I get to talk about how we do our, our methodology. So you know, primary sources, um, you know, these, are, these can include all of these types right here. But you know, these are things produced by states. Um, sometimes about themselves, sometimes about other states, right? So they include intelligence estimates, you know, congressional testimonies, classified documents. We have uh, programmatic and budgetary documents. 
military parades. There's a nice example right there of North Korea. Um, this gives us things that we can measure, right? Uh, really, really useful data. Um, weapon system tests and things like treaty disclosure data. So this is data that I asked for uh, the State Department for. Um, this is just the aggregate data, but I have like this whole 100 page document of all the disaggregated data and things. They give it to you if you ask for them, if you know the, the person to talk to. Um, and uh, this was the data that we would get under the New START Treaty, which we now will no longer get. It's very frustrating. It makes our job a lot harder. Um, there are some concerns and challenges that come with this kind of thing. So uh, first of all, there's always a risk that um, documents produced by a government are going to be subject to the political biases of that particular government. Um, so you, know, you, you risk. Uh, the possibility that when the Pentagon or the United States or something like that puts out an, a national intelligence estimate, you risk that these things are obviously politically motivated or have, have other considerations as to, as to why they're, they're saying the things that they're saying. It's also important to remember that certain intelligence or government aid, aid agencies sorry, have very different opinions uh, about the, the state of the global, <laughs> global nuclear forces, right? You'll have something that gets put out, for example, by the Defense Intelligence Agency about China's nuclear arsenal. I have this nice graph here that we've put together. Um, the DIA tends to be a lot more hawkish about China's nuclear arsenal growth than other elements of the United States government. And so, you know, here you have estimates from DIA, CIA, STRATCOM, OSD policy. Um, these are all, all over the map. Uh, most of them have not come true, but some of them are a little closer to, to a more accurate representation than others. And DIA has been like way, way off, right? So, when we get estimates from certain intelligence agencies, very important to remember that is not necessarily representative of the entire US government, the entire US intelligence community, the entire DOD, um, things like that. Another concern with, with primary sources, and this is one that I alluded to earlier, only some countries publish this type of data. So for that, you have to rely on, on very different types of sources. Um, the US is probably the most consistent publisher of this because they have to um, justify a lot of things to Congress, which is very helpful. Um, the UK publishes a little bit, so does France. Um, Russia does to a kind of, in kind of an interesting way, <laughs> which I guess we can talk about a bit. Um, China, India, and Pakistan really don't, and Israel and North Korea definitely don't. So um, you really, you have to kind of know when, depending on the country that you're reporting on, you have to kind of make a judgment about whether or not you can, whether primary sources are a useful tool or whether you have to go to something like secondary sources. Um, so secondary sources, some examples. Um, news media reports, think tank analysis, um, open source research, basically some of the stuff that we do, uh, and industry publications are all, are all useful. These also come with big caveats, the first of which is quality of reporting. Um, you know, there are a lot of really different standards about how to report on nuclear weapons in, in lots of different countries. Um, so it's, it's always really important you know, as you guys know, to, to have these kind of media literacy skills, to know which publications you, know, you can trust and, and who you can't. Um, this can sometimes be really challenging, though, because uh, countries that have, or I guess news agencies that are typically very close to the defense industry in certain countries, for example, like TASS in Russia, will just say, source, source, <laughs> source says this. You don't really know if it's true. You can kind of assume that it, it maybe is, but um, you don't know who they're talking about. You don't know if that individual has uh, actually insights into that particular weapon system. You don't know why they're saying what they're saying, and they're completely anonymous. Um, so it's, it's really difficult to make those judgments sometimes. Um, you also get media, a lot of media embellishment about nuclear weapons um, in all sorts of different countries. Um, this is particularly true in countries that don't release a lot of information about nuclear weapons. There's a lot, there's a big vacuum there for uh, media organizations to come in and just attribute nuclear capability to something that is not nuclear capable. This happens a lot in India and Pakistan, especially, um, where we will have, uh, we'll have you know, organizations that will just say, Brahmos missile, it's capable of carrying nuclear warheads. That is not really the case. Um, you know, there are, there's no public evidence that the Brahmos can carry nuclear weapons, um, and a number of uh, intelligence agencies have put out statements basically saying the Brahmos is a conventional missile. But we get this all the time where, where we have uh, organizations just saying, like, 
yeah, this is a scary looking missile. We're going to say it's nuclear capable, and that is, is not necessarily true. Um, so the, I guess the open source information landscape is changing a lot, um, you know, and, and we're, things are getting networked more, you know, lots of emerging technologies, but the, the most significant change is happening in the satellite imagery space. And so we're, we're now at the point where, um, you know, the, these, these huge improvements in satellite imagery technology, um, plus the, the fact that now we can access really high resolution, um, very high cadence, like on a daily basis, um, that kind of imagery allows independent observers to search for things all over the globe um, and track military developments basically in real time, which is really exciting. And so this has become really apparent with analysis of North Korea in the past few years. Um, we've seen, you know, researchers have been able to track just like extreme minutia, things like smoke at a factory indicating that it's potentially operational, right? Even potentially catching a missile test as it's happening, which is wild, that's an amazing photo. Um, and also, you know, being able to kind of find these, these big stories, uh, things like the, you know, the, the conclusion that China is building these massive missile silos in the middle of the desert. This was, um, uh, disclosure that I was involved in. Um, it was a lot of fun, as we'll actually walk through it uh, really quickly. Um, so this is kind of an overview here. Um, we worked with the New York Times to publish this. Um, and the methodology, I find, is, is quite interesting because it gives you a sense of how the open source work that one group of researchers can do, it almost always builds on open source work that other researchers are doing in the same field. And so, you know, between 2018 and 2020, there were a lot of researchers noting that China was starting to build um, just kind of like the, these kind of prototypes for silos all over the country in, in different places. And, you know, they all looked a little bit different. It was kind of unclear what exactly was going to happen. Um, but then in 2021, my, my colleague Tom um, noted that there were 16-ish silos um, under construction of the, the Chinese missile training at GLFI. Um, and the really important thing to note here is that what he saw, um, which was very new, were these inflatable air domes, um, which you can see right there. And those were being built to cover each individual silo fully. And the, you know, these domes are really fascinating because they, they don't really, at least from, we have, from what we have seen, we've not seen them anywhere else in China. Um, they're, and not only that, they're tied really clearly to these like semicircle structures, which would be used to build the silo walls. So we had this great signature when we saw that, where we were like, oh my God, all right, we've got, we've got these domes, and we've got these silo walls, we've got a big hole in the ground, like probably these are all connected in some way to, to what's going to be China's pretty nascent silo program. But they're just for playing for us. Uh, well, <laughs> they could, yeah, I guess they all, they could have been playing a lot of tennis in the desert, um, but I don't know, that's <laughs> slightly less credible. Um, so then a few months later, there's a big discovery um, by Decker Eveleth, um, who's at Reed College at the time, and what he found was that this was really the first indication of how China was going to operationalize these silos. He found 120 of them in the desert. And the big signature that was linking uh, this, all of these different things to China's uh, ICBM program was these air bombs. So that, those all popped up in the desert and then that you know, made it pretty clear that, that that's what they were. Right, so, cool yeah, what's up? So how far away are those geographs? These three kilometers from Jin Fluck, Dolan Tai to. Oh, not that far. Yeah, they're, um, uh, I don't have the exact kilometers in my head. They're in roughly the same region of the country. So, like, when you do this, do you have, like, AI that looks for this signature? You have to support I have my very sad eyes uh, that are <laughs> very strained. Um, that need laser eyes for free. Um, but yeah, there's no AI um, at the moment. That's It's probably something that will that will be coming online over the next you know, like five to ten years or so. We're going to see likely, uh, you know, AI models and things like that where you can feed in signatures, right, like this and say, okay, show me everything in this, you know, in this particular area of interest that has, that looks like that. 
and then it'll pop back out. You, you have a bunch of pictures, and then you can use your eyes to see, okay, that's a real thing, that's not a real thing. Um, it doesn't, it's not really workable yet, but it, it will. Like, that's clearly where the trend is going. So um, we made some assumptions because we, you know, we saw this, and we were like, there's probably more, right? That, that, was, um, that was a big assumption that we made based on how the United States was talking about China's program and calling it a breathtaking expansion. It's like, oh, that can't, that can't be one people. There's, there's more than one people. Um, the second thing, you know, what, what I assumed at the time was that um, almost certainly these other silo fields will probably have similar signatures, right? So, um, you know, what we saw at UMEN, you know, we're probably going to have something like this. They're probably going to be spaced apart in the same way. It's probably going to be roughly the same area, 800 square kilometers. Um, the third assumption that I made was that the silos, and I think this came up earlier, was that they'd be located deeper inside China um, than any other uh, Chinese silos, and that they'd roughly be in the same area because, you know, just logistically speaking, it's really hard to build these kinds of things. You're probably going to have the same individuals working on it with the like materials all over the country. Um, that's hard. It takes a lot of work. It's, it costs money. So for all sorts of reasons, that was kind of the assumption that I made. Um, and it worked and found it in a couple hours. Um, and then so we, uh, this was the next silo field that we found, um, was, um, these domes there. And um, the thing that we had to do before going to print was um, you know, validating everything, right? Because um, this is how you do good, good OSINT, is like you have to question every single possible thing. So we had big questions that we were asking ourselves internally as a team, right? Could this be something else? You know, could it be, um, you know, some, some kind of civilian infrastructure? It just didn't make sense. It didn't match anything. And something that's really important when you do this kind of satellite imagery work is you have to know, you have to be familiar enough with the country to know this is what it looks like on a normal, on a normal day. And then, then you spot the things that don't look normal. If you go out looking for something really specific, you will find it because things look weird and suspicious from space all the time. So um, we had to, you know, we had to question a lot of things. We also went and looked at when did construction begin, what did it look like at each stage, it matched really closely what we saw elsewhere, and then what evidence is linking it to the broader program. We saw these walls again, and so we we went to print and worked with the New York Times for this, and then um, got some official validation. Um, so that's sort of an example of like a, a micro level investigation that we do. This is kind of our, our big thing. Um, we'd love to work with you guys on, on any of this kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, but I guess just, I don't know, I don't know if we have to talk about any minutes we have. Um, about five minutes, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'll, less than five. Um, so, but I guess, you know, before, before we wrap up, um, something I wanted to, Offer is sort of just like a top level view of, of what we're seeing in terms of um, how nuclear arsenals are changing over time. We've talked about it a little bit already, so I've scrapped all the things we've already talked about, and I have some things that nobody has talked about yet. But if you look at the number of nuclear weapons and how it's changing on a year to year basis, right, which is uh, this gray line right there, right? So that's since 2000, it's, it's gone down. The picture looks a lot better than it is in reality. Um, because you're seeing, right, you know, like we're slowly trickling down, right? We're, we're, you know, we've made a lot more progress and that's slightly less progress, but we are, we are going down. That is only the case because of the United States and Russia dismantling retired warheads, right? They, they dismantle a couple hundred of those warheads every year. Um, and that is where the, the good news on disarmament ends. Um, so what the really important line to focus on and I would encourage folks to, to think about this in, in your reporting and when you're writing stories, is this orange line, which is the number of warheads in global military stockpiles. And these are the warheads that are deployed or could be deployed very, very shortly um, on, a, on a pretty rapid basis. That number is going up um, and has been going up over the past couple of years, but it's going to continue to go up pretty significantly over the next coming years. And that's a problem. Right? Because, you know, yes, like we have all these old retired warheads that the U.S. and Russia don't care about anymore, and those are going down. It's great. But, like, this is the stuff that would actually be used in the context of a nuclear conflict that's increasing. Um, and it's going to continue to increase because of 
countries like China, who are pretty significantly building up their nuclear forces. Russia is building up its nuclear forces. India, Pakistan, North Korea, all slowly increasing. Um, and the UK potentially also increasing as of 2021, a very exciting surprise. Um, so, you know, why is this happening? Um, I'd say a few things, some of them were touched on already. Um, you know, all states are modernizing their, their, their nuclear arsenals. Um, they're also uh, increasing the role of nuclear weapons in their doctrines. Um, and, you know, one thing that, that hasn't really been touched on that much today, but I'd say it's, it's increasingly difficult to ignore the role that defensive uh, military systems have in spurring on offensive uh, military armaments. And so, you know, we're often seeing a lot of media hype around things like hypersonic weapons, um, which is the new, the new big thing. Um, these are missiles that are designed to fly at high speeds on highly maneuverable trajectories. And that's the, the key here is, it's not that they're fast, the, the important part about them is that they're maneuverable. The reason why they're maneuverable is because they're built to get around and circumvent missile defenses. And so the increase in missile defenses that are being deployed, both in a regional context and in a, in a homeland security context, is in, in some part spurring on some of this development. Um, and so, you know, for example, in 2018, um, Putin gave that big speech right, where he said, you know, we have these like six or seven new big offensive systems and they're very scary and one of them's hypersonic and another one is also hypersonic and one is like a laser and one is something else. It doesn't matter. The important point about all those things is that every single one of them was specifically designed to circumvent missile defenses and he said that about like 10 times in his speech, right? So it's, it's really important to, to focus on this bit here. Um, and then the last thing I'll note is that um, we've also seen the, the decline and just sort of the general disinterest in arms control um, as a means for, for limiting the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, today, we're seeing that you know, bilateral and multilateral arms control treaties are just falling away entirely. Our last one, New START, is basically dead in the water. Um, and what we've seen, especially over the past, really over the past like five or six years, is that um, there's been this shift away from treating other countries as potential arms control partners and instead treating them as like, just like a, like a country that you want to scold, right? Or like the points of it. And that is not the basis for a successful arms control uh, regime. And so it's, it's really frustrating. It was especially frustrating during the Trump administration. It hasn't really gotten that much better since then, to be honest. Um, but there was a lot of like point scoring instead of um, real attempts to, to make things safer. Um, and so, you know, just on the, on New Start, which is, um, kind of frustrating, you know, the, the important implications of this are that both the United States and Russia have really meticulously planned their nuclear arsenals um, under the assumption that neither of them is going to break out of the new Star Treaty. The problem is now we are getting, you know, we are having all these indications from um, domestically in the United States, you know, that where people are saying, oh, we need to we need to break out of the New START Treaty because Russia is going to break out of the New START Treaty and we're going to upload and it's going to be a whole thing. Um, if both countries decided to break out of the New START Treaty, they could, really generally speaking, double the number of warheads that they currently have deployed. Very worrying stuff. Um, so that's basically it for me. I have gifts. Um, one is our website, the Status of World Nuclear Forces webpage. Um, it's, there's a lot more information than just this, but it could be useful for folks as you go about your reporting. Um, if you're ever looking for information about nuclear weapons, it's a good place to go. Also coming soon, we're going to have pages about individual countries, what is going on in each country to the point where if you are, if you're working on a story and you're like, I want to know what's going on with France, we will have a France page. It has, it will have everything. So that's our next thing. The next big thing is um, next Monday, is the release of the next uh, edition of the CEPR yearbook, um, which uh, is this really phenomenal undertaking in which you know there are a lot of different contributors. It happens every year and it covers pretty much the entire global scope of what is going on in, in military forces around the world. Um, I co-write the nuclear chapters for this along with my colleague Hans. Um, and it's, it's going to be a big fun story. We have some updates planned and things like that. So if you're looking for a potential next story about nuclear weapons. Um, 
London. And if you want an embargoed copy of that, talk to me. Um, and also, contact it, so send me. Great, well, thanks. Thank you very much. So good news is they're going to be picked up at 5.40 by the bus driver and go directly from there to the uh, nuclear museum where another piece of good news is that it's food and drink. Um, that means, however, that uh, we have to limit you to one to two questions for Matt before Sylvia Mishra can speak. Um, who do I see? There. Uh, yeah, Matt, I know you spoke to this a little bit, um, but can you just talk about, like, how do you get satellite imagery down to something usable? I mean, like, I've logged on to the European Satellite Agency stuff, and I'm just looking at clouds flying by and not knowing what the hell's going on the ground, and then getting anything that's not a pixel is very difficult. And then, um, just with regards to different satellite image providers, I guess you have, like, the European stuff, which I mentioned, the Planet Labs folks, Maxar, which is taking DOD contracts, so I'm just curious if you can suss out the credibility of those different uh, providers. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So um, there are a lot of different satellite imagery providers, and they're good at different things. So there are certain imagery providers like Planet, as you mentioned. Planet is a great, great company that um, their mission is basically to image the entire Earth every single day, um, which is great. The problem with that is that um, in order to send up that many satellites, they have to be kind of small, and so they can't take really high resolution imagery. So for the higher resolution stuff, you might need to go to a company like Maxar or something, something else, uh, which doesn't take as frequent imagery, imagery but um, is at really high resolution. So we use um, a range of things. We, we never rely on just one satellite imagery company. We have contacts with a lot of different ones, and some are free. So um, probably the, the best one that is, there are the best two that are freely available. One is, is Google Earth, which is just basically a, um, it, it pulls imagery from a lot of different places. So it pulls from places like Airbus and, um, you know, from, from Maxar and, you know, all sorts of places. Um, and that's free to use. Uh, another one that I'd recommend is uh, Sentinel Hub, which is, um, that's a European service. So it gets, has different satellite access and coverage. And it comes up more frequently, probably like every three days or so with a pretty decent resolution. So those are the free ones. Planet, I have found, and I think other organizations have found, is extremely willing to give um, very reduced price or potentially free access to folks who are doing good journalism about nuclear weapons um, and also other issues like climate and stuff like that. That's also important. Um, so Planet, um, we've worked with for some time. Uh, we use them for, for this investigation. Um, and they're, they're a really flexible, very chill company. Uh, and then there are other like more commercial ones like Maxar where you have to pay the you know expensive entry fee, but the entry is really good. So it's like you use a bit of everything. If you say high resolution or low resolution, what resolution do you mean? So planet, their standard kind of resolution that you can get on a daily basis is three meters, which is pretty good. You you can identify like you could probably see a very blurry car on the road, but you can't really see much of you know, what type of car is or something. But you can see boats in the water and stuff like that on planet, like three meters is good for that. So you can see subs. Um, higher resolution, like with Maxar or some of the higher end stuff on planet is like half a meter or like 0.3, which is really good. So you can see, you can see a lot. Uh, you can see all sorts of things.